Welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. As usual, I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, and tonight, we're going to talk about compassion. Compassion is the theme of this evening. Um, just so you know, we're going to be talking about karunya. We're going to actually be talking about what would be called maha karunya, the great compassion. Um, but I'm going to talk about the difference, that, that distinction between what would be called just compassion or the, the great compassion. Um, yeah, so let me, let me start us off here tonight and let you know, um, for a while now, on Sunday nights, I've been doing this series um, where we've been looking at what would be called the Bodhisattva path. And also kind of along with that, we've basically been looking at what would be called Mahayana Buddhism, but basically Mahayana Buddhism and the Bodhisattva path are one and the same thing. You don't have one without the other in that way. And so tonight, I'm going to talk about this idea of compassion, such, such an important idea. Um, but we're going to talk about it kind of as usual, juxtaposing sort of what is called or what is often referred to as the early form of Buddhism, and then this Mahayana tradition. And as usual, we're going to read a little bit from a sutra that we've been looking at, a Mahayana Buddhist sutra. So really quickly, I want to remind everybody about a very kind of um, just a really important distinction that to be made. So if you don't know the kind of the long, larger history of Buddhism, a quick summary, just really quickly. So we all kind of know maybe probably that Buddhism, as it's called, basically kind of begins with the life of the Buddha, who we pretty much think lived around 500 BC. Some people put it like more like 400 BC. Some people put it way back like 600 BC. So 500 BC or so. And we know a lot about life at the time of the Buddha. Fortunately, there's a lot of historical records, mainly Buddhist. And those are what would be called the Pali Canon or the suttas. But I want to, I have actually a lot to say about that Pali canon and that idea. It's, it's going to be something we want to, I want to address tonight is the idea of the, the Pali canon and this early form of Buddhism. But the idea is, is that at the time of the Buddha and what seems like for a few hundred years after that, so 400 BC, 300 BC, 200 BC, Buddhism was definitely a forest dwelling, ascetic, celibate yoga group, basically. Like what it meant to be a Buddhist was that you were, you were going to leave home. You were going to leave the wife and kids. You were going to quit your job. You were going to renounce. And then you would go off to the woods and find a group of Buddhists and they would shave your head give you some robes, give you a begging bowl, and you would begin a life of practice and a life of begging, a celibate life, a life primarily focused on meditation, on what we would call nowadays meditation. And the whole point of that, the whole point of renouncing, the whole point of doing the practice, the whole point of meditating, was to purify oneself, purify one's mind, purify one's karma. And with enough practice, you could actually purify your entire being. Purify it of what, you may ask? Well, the three poisons, of course. Greediness, anger, and delusion. So if you practiced and were in the woods meditating, you could eventually get rid of those. And that's what Buddhism was about. 
for at least a few hundred years. Eventually something happened though, and it happened in India. Most historians, most scholars would say that this happened in Northern India. So like the Indus Valley, or even actually a little further north in what is today Pakistan, but something in that more Northern region started to happen. And what started to happen there was that a kind of new form of Buddhism started to develop. And it wasn't a forest dwelling, ascetic, celibate yoga group. It was an urban householder dwelling with maybe with jobs, but a basically an urban form of Buddhism. But if you've been coming to Dharma Doors, if you or if you've kind of listened to some of my other talks, I'm really quick to point out that this new form of Buddhism, which is basically Mahayana Buddhism, it is not a lay householder form of like the real Buddhism. This Mahayana tradition that begins in like kind of Northern India, probably around 200 BC or so, we're not exactly sure, but that tradition is a, in, in my opinion, and not just mine alone, but many people's opinions, a, a more advanced form of Buddhism, not a watered down version for lay people. And the way that I often kind of articulate this is that it seems that, and even by his own admittance in the suttas, it seems that the Buddha created a, like a safe space to practice out in the woods, out in the Aranyaka, right? So the idea was the city whew, is crazy. Having a job and all of that stuff, that's crazy. Why don't you come out to the woods where it's quiet, there's not a lot of pressure, and it's safe? Come on. And so the early form of Buddhism and the early Buddhist traditions were very much about creating these, we would basically call them an ashram, but like these safe spaces for practice that were away from the insanity of, of the urban spaces. What seems to have happened with this Mahayana, this great vehicle is and this happens not overnight, of course, okay? This happens slowly, you know, who knows exactly the period, you know, how long this takes. But what happens is, is that this new form of Buddhism is interested in making the world a safe place for practice. Not just a special place out in the woods, so how do we do that? How do we begin a transformation process that creates a safe space in the whole world? Well, that's gonna require some bodhisattvas. And so the first thing that I wanna kind of point out is that you could sort of make a distinction in terms of early Buddhism and Mahayana Buddhism. You could make a distinction of sort of forest dwelling versus urban. I think that that's kind of a, a safe thing to do, except for there are forest dwelling versions of Mahayana Buddhism. And so the reason why I said earlier, Mahayana Buddhism is not just a watered down lay version. It's because the Mahayana tradition includes the monastic celibate path, but it also includes this bodhisattva path who's in the urban spaces, who is in the city, but is a practitioner and is actually doing the practice, but in the world in that sense. And that's one of the reasons why I'm actually a teacher in that sense of Mahayana Buddhism, 
why I promote it so much is because I actually think it's the Buddhism everybody wants in that way, in the sense of not only for householders, but also a, a form of Buddhism that's socially engaged, as Thich Nhat Hanh might say, but a form of Buddhism that's interested in transforming the world, not just transforming one's individual mind. So it's on that note that I want to begin kind of talking about compassion. So this idea of karunya, compassion, you will definitely find it in the early Pali canon, in that early tradition. The one thing that I want to mention, though, about that Pali canon, everybody should know that the history of this, meaning the history that I just talked about, early Buddhism, and then this Mahayana tradition, we don't exactly know what life was like at the time of the Buddha. We don't exactly know what those first few hundred years were like. But after this Mahayana Buddhism started to develop in kind of Northern India, there were a group of Buddhists who said, that's not Buddhism. We know what Buddhism really is. What Buddhism really is, is being in the forest, being celibate and meditating. And so that group, they were called the Stahviravadins, but you probably know them as the Theravadins. After the rise of Mahayana Buddhism, this group said, no, 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 this is the real Buddhism. This is the original Buddhism in Pali. And it's called celibacy, forest dwelling meditation. So my point is, is that this thing that we rely on for records of early Buddhism, it's not exactly a total record of early Buddhism. It's a later group's decision about what early Buddhism looked like. So always good to keep that in mind. But let, using that, relying on the Pali Canon for now, if you go looking through all of the thousands and thousands of suttas, the teachings of the Buddha in the Pali Canon, you come across karunya, compassion, a, a, a handful of times. It's not the most prevalent topic in the vast corpus of the Pali Canon. It's there, though you will find karunya and where you will find compassion is in a list of four meditative states. And I've talked about these meditative states. Um, many weeks ago, I did a class on mudita. Mudita is this idea of joy or empathic joy. It's also one of these four meditative states. So these are usually called the Brahma Viharas interesting connection to last week's talk on brahmacharya, the practice of Brahma. So the Brahma viharas, the abodes of Brahma, are these meditative states that the Buddha talks about in the early, early Pali canon. And he talks about these states of mind that one can place oneself in, in order to transcend sort of the, the kamadatu, the realm of desire, and get into these deeper trance-like meditative states. It begins with metta, friendliness, kindness, usually translated as loving kindness, but it begins with that idea of generating a sense of loving kindness or metta. And then karunya, compassion, then mudita, joy, joy for others. And then finally, upeksha, equanimity, even keeledness, kind of equanimity is usually the way it's translated. I did a class on upeksha as well. I guess I'm gonna have to do a class on metta soon to, to round it out. But the point is, is that karunya, compassion, 
sympathy, this sort of, you know, meta, meta is about friendliness. Meta is about meeting others with a, a smile, meeting others with friendliness and kindness, being, being nice. <laughs> That's meta. Karunya, compassion, it's that next step. And that next step I mean is, is it's not just a smile, it's not just friendliness, it's actual deeper, like even what we would call empathy in that way, like a real concern for others' well-being, how they're really doing in that way. So again, metta is this kind of friendliness that we meet others with. Compassion is this deep concern for others' well-being in that way. Now, the thing about it is, though, is that in the Pali Canon, this idea of karunya, it's a tool for you. <laughs> it's a tool for you to calm your desirous, hate-filled, deluded mind down. Even loving kindness, even metta is a, a way to combat anger hatred, enmity, animosity, develop, you know, focus on metta. It'll help overturn hate in that way. So these practices of loving kindness, compassion, empathic joy, and even upeksha in the Pali Canon, which again represents this early tradition, even though we were extending this sort of sense of compassion and a sense of well-being and a sense of joy to others, it was for, and I don't want to say this, I don't mean this jokingly, it's like, but it was, it's for my benefit in that way. It's not actually, actually having anything to do with you in that way. Because the idea is, is I'm, I'm probably in my my zendo, or I'm in my meditation chamber meditating, thinking kind thoughts <laughs> about others. But it's to get myself into the Brahma Vihara so that I can chill out and be meditative and work on those three poisons of mine. So here we have another one of those situations where there's an idea, karunya, compassion, and you find it in the early Buddhist canon. And what the Mahayana Buddhist tradition seems to have done in a number of cases is sort of uh, reached into the Dharma treasury, right, of the early Pali canon and pulled out these particular jewels. Em emptiness is another one of these jewels where it's seldom talked about in the Pali Canon, but it's there. And it, it seems like the Mahayana tradition reached in and pulled out this idea of emptiness, pulled out this idea of loving kindness and compassion and joy, and in a way uses a lot of these original ideas of Buddhism, but it, it gives them a slight twist. And then that becomes sort of the foundation upon which this new form of urbanized, socially engaged Buddhism, you know, is founded on in that way. So that's where we get to what I was calling the Maha Karunya. So not just the Karunya of the Pali Canon. And my point is, is that you find this language in Mahayana Buddhist sutras. It's the language of the bodhisattva developing the great loving kindness, the great compassion, the great joy, the great equanimity. So the, the maha metta, maha karunya, maha mudita, maha upeksha, they talk about these things. And the reason why they make a distinction between the great compassion and just compassion is because the bodhisattva is, it's, 
uh, and this is basically the, what I want to talk about tonight, but compassion as a practice and not a meditative practice to calm down in that way, but compassion almost as the practice. Like you in many ways, and I'm, I'm not the only person to say this, if you're just compassionate, there's really not much else to it than that. Like kind of really seriously. It, it, it covers all bases, <laughs> generosity, kind, friendliness, kind speech. It's like, it's all wrapped up in actually being compassionate. And so one of the things I want to say tonight, if I don't, if I don't get a chance to say this, I ha it's a note I have. It's like I, the one thing I want to say tonight. So let me say it now so I don't forget. I know that, especially me, I know the Dharma doors here can get a little intellectual in that way. I'm kind of more of a Dharma nerd in that way. And so I know that we spend a lot of time talking about, well, emptiness, all the kind of deeper philosophy, non-duality. And on the note of this idea of non-duality, right? Uh, it's come up a lot in the sutra we've been reading. So it often occurs, it often occurs to the aspiring bodhisattva who is, you know, cultivating wisdom, is cultivating kind of ideas that would be called wisdom in that way. And it will occur to the bodhisattva. Isn't it dualistic to be compassionate? Because it sets up the paradigm of me being compassionate to others. Isn't it dualistic? I myself have often in the past had that question. And the one thing that I kind of want to say tonight about that, and I, if inter interestingly, I don't want to over intellectualize this. <laughs> My point is, is that I actually feel like we can get too intellectual about this, even in the realms of non-duality. And so I would really suggest that from the Bodhisattva point of view, compassion is number one. And, and what I mean about that is, is and I was sp I'm speaking very much from um, like personal experience and for, as far as my own practice and cultivation goes, that you can get a little, uh, you know, I will admit it, you can get a little arrogant when it comes to these philosophical ideas. Like we think we know something, we think we've understood something or got something. And so all of a sudden, a mind, again, a mind like my own many years ago, that's beginning to think, but wait, compassion's dualistic and so da 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 we've missed it we've missed the whole point if we're over intellectualizing it to that point and that's where for me it's been a great reminder to return to the practice of compassion to almost check to check my own spiritual ego to check my own um st uh, state of being in that way so tonight, tonight, the Dharma talk is about how compassion is number one in that way. But I'm talking about the Mahakarunya. I'm talking about the great compassion is number one. So when it comes to the Bodhisattva path, the idea of practicing compassion is not about calming my mind down so that I am in a Brahma Vihara meditative state. And that if I do that enough, I get enlightened. If you go back to, well, it's a, been a long time now, but when I first started this series on the Bodhisattva path, the first sort of installment in that series was a class on the Bodhisattva vow. And the vow is this, oh, 
It can sometimes, of course, be a, a formal vow that you might take like in a formal setting. You know, if you're getting initiated or ordained or something like that, then you could take a official, formal bodhisattva vow and maybe even get some sort of documentation certificate that you have indeed taken the bodhisattva vow. I know that such things exist. So whether you've taken the Bodhisattva vow formally or just as a, a changing of the mind, but what the vow is, is, well, it's a vow of altruism. It's a vow of genuine, not just compassion and concern for others, but as we, we've spoken about in the past, the Bodhisattva vow is actually this deep, Mm, I wouldn't call it a concern, more like an interest in that way, but a deep interest in seeing that all other sentient beings are awakened, freed of their suffering. In the early Buddhist tradition that I've been mentioning, you make a vow to give up your bad habits. You make a vow to walk the straight path, and you make a vow basically to get enlightened yourself. The Bodhisattva makes this vow to basically enlighten all others in a way, and I'll have more to say about that. But right there, that's a huge difference in terms of, and it's a huge difference in terms of you know, what it looks like in practice, but it's a huge difference in terms of the heart. And I often describe the Bodhisattva vow as an outward turning of the heart, a true, genuine outturning of the heart where one is deeply compassionate for all sentient beings and actually wants to see all sentient beings not suffering and is ready to do the deep work to bring that about. As insurmountable as that seems, as impossible and paradoxical as that seems to be able to liberate all sentient beings for them, for, from their suffering, despite the paradox, despite the insurmountability, it's what the Bodhisattva vows to do. Now, again, I think that what's really important about this is not like, <laughs> what, does the Bodhisattva know that's impossible? Like, I, I don't, it's not about that. It's actually about the heart that would like it to be the case to actually, for it to actually be the case that all sentient beings are liberated of their suffering. Like the heart that really wants that versus a heart that's just self-consumed and just looking out for their own self-interest, even if it's a spiritual self-interest. And so the Bodhisattva has, again, what I call that outward turning of the heart that really, really wants the best for everybody in that sense. And then at that moment, when the Bodhisattva has made that vow, like truly has said, you know what, that is where my heart's at. Something very interesting will often happen to the bodhisattva who has made that vow. They will begin to notice how conditioned they are to not be compassionate. They will begin to notice how conditioned they are to withhold kindness. And you begin to realize, wow, why am I, why? Why, huh, why is, am I being, like, why is that person, why are they, am I getting angry at them? Why am I not generating loving kindness and compassion for that person? Huh, better work on that in that sense. And so, again, the point is, is that the, this bodhisattva path is this whole kind of other 
this whole kind of other thing, even though it's not, it's, it's Buddhism. It's the exact same kind of idea, except with this extra level of, well, of helping everybody. But you know what the Mahayana Buddhist tradition does? So the Mahayana Buddhist tradition does something also very interesting. They look around and they see the Buddha who became enlightened and who with great compassion for the world came back and told us all about the Dharma. Tremendously compassionate act to do that. Whereas the celibate monastics out in the woods, well, they're just running around following what the Buddha said. So shouldn't we be trying to be like the Buddha and not the people running around following the Buddha? And that's where you get the idea that a bodhisattva is kind of a Buddha in training. <laughs> that a bodhisattva is going for being a Buddha, not an enlightened individual, not the most enlightened person in the forest. They're going for this Buddha level status. And what makes a Buddha a Buddha? One thing is the great compassion where the Buddha came back and taught us all about the Dharma. So that's where all of a sudden the Mahayana says, oh, no, 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 no. You early Buddhist people, you, you missed something. <laughs> you, you missed something out there in the forest, and you should have noticed what the Buddha did in that way. And so these bodhisattvas are now out in the world. And there's a way in which, of course, that a bodhisattva and this is part of the tradition, by the way, I'm not just making this up. A bodhisattva studies the Dharma, like studies the Pali Canon, learns all the Dharma. Does a bodhisattva meditate? Of course a bodhisattva meditates. <laughs> Does a bodhisattva get rid of the three poisons? Of course the bodhisattva gets rid of the three poisons. So my point is, is that the practice of a bodhisattva is Buddhism, mindfulness, precepts, more morality basically is what I mean. Like they do the Buddhism, but they're doing it with this outwardly turned heart for the benefit of all sentient beings. So that's a kind of a definition of the great compassion of a bodhisattva. Any questions, comments, answers, or ideas about the great compassion? Yeah, Vicky. Hmm. I can't wait. I'm going to use this fancy mic. I haven't asked you a question in a while. I have a I question. Um, so I'm thinking about, like, when you started, you talked about how you might think compassion is dualistic. That doesn't seem, well, we'll see if I have words. It's like, I have a hard time understanding that because it seems like if you understand that everything is really all one thing and we're all connected and part of like, like nothing is separate, then how could you help but having compassion for everything that is part of that thing? Because all the parts aren't separate and even like what's happening to any of the parts isn't separate because it's all one thing. So it seems like as soon as you lack compassion, that's where that's when you're separating me from you and you're kind of selfing. So then I don't understand. <laughs> so that makes sense. So then I, so then you're talking about how like the bodhisattva path, well, assuming I have that right, then that makes sense. But then you're talking about how the bodhisattva path is separate from or different from like regular Buddhism, whatever the other thing is, because it has this compassion piece added to it. But I don't understand how the other Buddhists could be doing Buddhism if they're not doing if they're not having compassion, maybe it's just in the way that they're acting, but I don't see they, how, how they couldn't be experiencing compassion and still doing Buddhism. So everything you said in the beginning about 
how, can, how could compassion be even seen as dualistic? All of that was spoken like a true bodhisattva. So all of that was on point. What I was mentioning at the, at the outset was sort of, I shouldn't have even used the language then of, of a, a newly uh, aspired bodhisattva. I should have just said that a, a, a new student of the Dharma can sometimes think that compassion sounds dualistic because I'm extending you compassion. And so doesn't that preserve a kind of subject object, me and you status? Now, again, what you said, Vicky, is totally the, the bodhisattva understanding, which is based on wisdom, wisdom of emptiness, all of that, absolutely. But your question though really is important. And it's another point that I, uh, so I, all I'm gonna do by the way, everybody is just add on to what Vicky said, because what she said was awesome. So it's about how actually in the early, the early Buddhist tradition or that school, that early school, and I don't wanna to get too carried away with all of this, but the basic understanding of that early school is while, while there is, a kind of, um, oh, I shouldn't say too much though, because then we'll be here too long. The basic idea of the early school is that everybody is in a sense responsible for their own karma. And a very, very classic early Buddhist way of talking about that is they say, when I eat, it doesn't satisfy your hunger. So my karmic action, it, it has to do with my karma. And so nothing that I do from an early Buddhist point of view can affect your karma, meaning your habits, your actions, and the karmic results that need to come back to you as an individual. Nothing I do can affect that. And so actually compassion, it, it, it's from that early Buddhist point of view, it can only affect my own karma because even as compassionate as I am to you, the way that you receive that and what you do with it is gonna be kind of your karmic situation. This, again, this is from an early Buddhist point of view that's much more dualistic down the line. I mean, they're very, very dualistic. Whereas the Bodhisattva in the Mahayana tradition recognizes that the very ideas that we have about ourselves are these socially constructed ideas about ourselves. And so like Vicky, like you were saying, we are already bound up together in these kind of well, dependent, codependently originated situations. And now all of a sudden, the compassion can function in the way that Vicky was talking about, where it is non dualistic. And, and like Vicky said, which was so smart, actually not being compassionate is dualistic, which that's hot, by the way. That's like awesome. So, <laughs> um, so does that say anything? <laughs> Yes, thank you. I think I hadn't weirdly hadn't thought about like karma cycles hmm. of karma being dualistic before, which obviously like, they kind of are. So that makes that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Yeah, you should. What's your question? Um, yeah, thank you for um, you know um, talking about this. I really enjoyed this. Uh, teaching because you know it's very I believe I mean I, in my experience it's kind of true you know and um, I don't think that it, I mean I don't experience it as dualistic but you know I'm um, I kind of I practice a uh, or I try my best you know uh, to practice uh, love as much as I can but 
and, and compassion is a variant, I feel like sure. that is. And, um, you know, I've been kind of exploring, I mean, I'm formally affiliated with a, a Sufi order that, you know, it's all about love, uh, all of it. And we are, we have like these different, um, we look at, uh, they're called the names of God is what they're called. And we uh, meditate on them and we think about all of the ways that we experience love. And a lot of times it's not something that feels good. Sometimes it's something very dishonoring or abasing. And so, and, but the unified, I came to Sufism through Buddhism actually here in San Francisco through some teachers here. And um, I, it's fascinating to me because, you know, especially like in the pandemic, you know, a lot of people have suffered, a lot of people have died, you know, um, kind of seemingly needlessly, you know, but there's so many, like with every bit of pain, there is a silver lining. And I think that's really the lesson uh, that I've learned. And I loved your term codependent origination. That's so um, true. <laughs> You know, I mean, it's just like we're <laughs> we're we're doing this together. You know, a mutual experience, and so, um, but it's in, in in Islam. There's a concept like the central theological concept is called tawhid, which means oneness. Like a un, you know, you can't separate it. And in Sufism, you know, where there can be nothing like all of this that we're experience is the divine. You know, in essence, you know. And in Buddhism, I think it was, um, what was his name? Vinny Ferraro, he once defined uh, Dukkha as being a part. And I found that to be fabulously, I mean, I just love that. Mm. that or feeling a part or being a part mm. or something like that. And it's when you think that you're not part of this, the, you know, um, the bliss beyond blisses, you know, is kind of how I say it. I don't know. I just wanted to mention that because it, it you know, when you were talking about the, the dualism, I yeah. it piqued my interest. So, but I haven't been, you know, sitting here to listen with you some, for some time and I'm overjoyed to be here this evening. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. You should. Thanks for the comment. Thanks for the connection too, with the Sufi tradition. Always nice to hear. Any other questions, comments, answers, ideas? Cool, so let's look at this sutra. Um, so as you know, also part of this series on the Bodhisattva path, we've been reading a sutra. This has been one of these uh, very, um, uh, you know, one of those sutras that nobody's really probably thought about or looked about, <laughs> looked at in hundreds of years, uh, but I love the obscure sutras. Um, Oh, by the way, I did want to mention that. So the sutra that we're reading, which is this sutra about the Bodhisattva Manjushri's pure land. Um, as most of you know, or many of you know, this sutra comes from a collection of sutras called the Maharatnakuta collection, the heap of jewels. And if you study this collection of sutras, you will learn that it goes back to um, a particular type of Mahayana Buddhism that was very, uh, very, very popular in what is today Afghanistan. At the time, it would have been known as Gandhara or the Gandharan Empire, um, but in what we today call Afghanistan. And that was a major metropolis, by the way, at the time. And the time period I'm talking about now is probably about three or 400 AD. So many hundreds of years after the time of the Buddha. Buddhism, by the way, if you didn't know, Buddhism was very popular in Central Asia, Afghanistan area, even more popular than it was in India. It well, it was like the um, it truly sort of the national religion. That's not quite the proper terminology, but it was the, the, the religion of that area. And it's a very, again, urbanized bodhisattva centered type of, of Buddhism. And 
I wanted to mention that time period because of a few ideas that are going to come up in this sutra. So the sutra, which is a long one, by the way, we finally reached the point through a lot of twists and turns where the Bodhisattva Manjushri is finally telling us about a little bit about his pure land. And of course, the kind of the cultivation or the purification of one's Buddha land is the way that they talk about the Bodhisattva path. Like that's what you're doing. You're not purifying your mind, you're purifying your Buddha land. It's a kind of a beautiful way to describe the practice. And as part of the purification of one's Buddha land, in this sutra, Manjushri has been telling us these various vows, these various determinations that he has made. There's going to be 10 in total. We've done the first four of them, I think. Uh, first five of them, actually. So we're going to do a few more of those, and we're going to learn more about, well, we're going to learn more about these vows. So if you haven't been coming, this is going to be a little weird. You're ju we're, we're jumping right into the deep end of this sutra. And the thing about it is, is that this sutra is about to get it's about to get really weird. And then in next week, it's gonna get even weirder. But it's already gotten a little weird because we've gone way back in time, like culpas and culpas and culpas and culpas ago to learn about how all of this got started for Manjushri. So we got the kind of the origin story or the backstory on Manjushri. And as part of this process, kulpas and kulpas and kulpas ago, Manjushri made these vows. And the vows were about, like, let me try to summarize the, the structure of them. But the vows are in the language of may, you know, or not until my Buddha land is like this. Not until then will I have attained full Buddhahood. Not until then will I have become a fully enlightened Buddha. So, and they were pretty wild. Um, like the like the first one was about kind of taking all these various Buddha lands and turning them all into one Buddha land, and then adorning them with jewels. And I went into detail about what all of that symbolism means. And it's all very symbolic, highly symbolic. So it's already gotten kind of weird. It's, and it's already like, we don't even really know where or when we are <laughs> anymore in the sutra. Like, are we still on, on the vulture's peak? Who knows? <laughs> and so at this point, after Manjushri has told us about five of of the vows, this other bodhisattva pipes up. And this bodhisattva, Lion Courage, he's been going back and forth with Manjushri the whole time, asking, hey, what's your Buddha land going to be like? And da 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 da. And so at this point, the bodhisattva, Lion Courage, thunderous voice, addresses the Buddha again and asks, World honored one, what will Manjushri be called upon becoming a Buddha? So this is a kind of a common thing. If you read these Mahayana sutras about bodhisattvas, the idea is, is that we often, when we are hearing about their future Buddha land, we will also then hear what they're going to be called because they're, they're going to have a new name as a Buddha, you know, just like Siddhartha. Siddhartha Gautama, right? The person who was born in India around 500 BC or so, family name Gautama, personal name Siddhartha, right? But upon becoming a Buddha, 
is known as Shakyamuni, the sage of the Shakya people. So that, that name change, the fact that Siddhartha became the Buddha Shakyamuni, that becomes the archetypal uh, moment or just an archetypal situation in which a bodhisattva gets a new name when they become a Buddha. So this bodhisattva wants to know what's, what's Manjushri going to be called when he becomes a Buddha? And the Buddha says, when Manjushri becomes a Buddha, he will be called Samanta Darshan universal vision or universal sight. What's the meaning of this name, Samanta Darshan? That Tathagata, that Buddha, will be visible within immeasurable hundreds of thousands of millions of Nayutas of Buddha lands throughout the 10 directions sentient beings who see that Buddha will most certainly attain Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. Samanta Darshan has not yet become a Buddha, yet if anyone hears that name, either while I'm here with you or after I've entered Nirvana, they will also most certainly attain Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. Okay, so this is a great opportunity for me to mention, to remind you of something that goes on with these Mahayana Sutras. So um, as everybody knows, there's, and I think Tanya put the, the link in, yeah. So in the link is, or in the chat is the link to an English translation of this sutra from the Tibetan. And we're really um, grateful for the Tibetan because the Tibetan is really close to the Sanskrit. And so we can learn what this Bodhisattva or Buddha's name actually is. And when I say actually is, when it comes to these names, it's kind of understood that they're kind of like mantras. And so, Oh, and actually, Yusha had you had that great comment. I'm not sure, I had the great comment about the names of God in, in the in the Sufi tradition. So these names of these Buddhas, it's kind of similar to that tradition, by the way. Like just in terms of like having all of these different names for the Buddha. So, in because these are kind of like mantras, it's kind of understood that you need the. Um, the sound of the name. So even though Samantha Darshan, da, and from the Chinese, we know what it means. It means seen everywhere. No, there's nowhere that you will not see this Buddha. So, so thus they are called Samantha Darshan. Now, the thing about it though, is, so I'm reading this sutra to you all tonight. And in this sutra that I'm reading to you, it makes this comment about um, Samantha Darshan hasn't become a Buddha just yet. But if anyone hears that name, they will be certain to attain Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. You just heard that name. <laughs> and so I often point out how these sutras are very aware that they are texts. They are very aware that they are stories. They're very aware that they are being read by someone. And so they actually have a little bit of fun with the fact that they know that you are reading them. And so they do things like that. And they're, they're kind of funny, in my opinion, but they're also very kind of interesting from a, like a literary perspective. So I just want to point that out, that that kind of is a funny exchange about anybody who gets to hear about this, this Buddha named Samantha Darshan. But then 
this is what I what I meant earlier by it's actually a little weird though because it's like yeah th that that it's like this weird thing where it, the sutra is telling us that samanta darshan doesn't exist yet but here we like I, it's just a weird thing where time time is really weird in this sutra and I've, i mentioned this i think last week where it's it's like I, it's just a weird continuity there where they're like, yeah, he'll become a Buddha, but he's not that Buddha yet. But you're hearing the name of what he will be when he's that. So where are we? <laughs> What's going on? Okay, but let's get to the vows. So the next three vows, they are all very similar in their nature. So it's why I wanted to do them uh, all tonight. And well, let me just do the, I'll do the first vow and we'll have a lot to talk about. So Manjushri again addresses the Buddha saying, world honored one, I also have this vow. Um, oh, and by the way, I'm not reading from the Tibetan one, by the way, but it follows it pretty closely. So he says, I also have this vow that just like the Buddha Amitabha, just like the Buddha Amitabha's pure land, where Dharma joy is used as food, in my Buddha land, the moment the thought of food arises a bodhisattva, in a bodhisattva's mind, a bowl, full of, a bowl full of delicacies will appear instantly in their right hand. And upon reflecting, they will think, I should definitely not eat of this myself until I have offered it to all the Buddhas of the Ten Directions and offered it to the impoverished, sent and to the impoverished, to sentient beings who are hungry, to hungry ghosts, until they are all satisfied. When the Bodhisattvas have this thought, they will instantly attain the five supernatural powers, traversing through space or the air unobstructed, going to immeasurable numbers of Buddha lands throughout the 10 directions, offering food to all of the Buddha Tathagatas, as well as all their followers in innumerable numbers of Buddha lands throughout the 10 directions as well as satisfying all the needs of all the impoverished, all sentient beings who are hungry and hungry ghosts. And then explaining the Dharma to them so as to free them from the thirst of desire. And then in a single thought moment, return to their original location. All right. So let me break that one down a little bit. Seven and eight are similar. So Manjushri has this dream. <laughs> he has this vision. He's made this vow. And this vow is, is that in, in his Buddha land, when he's a fully enlightened Buddha, in his Buddha land, it'll be like the Buddha land of Amitabha, where people just kind of live off of Dharma joy. Yeah, it'll be like that, but what'll happen is, is that when a bodhisattva even thinks of food, they'll instantly have like the best food in their right hand. And then in my Buddha land, all the bodhisattvas, before they even think of eating it themselves, they will generate a thought of offering it to the 10 Buddhas of the, or the Buddhas of the 10 directions, to all sentient beings, to the hungry ghosts. And only then will they eat of it. So there's actually a lot of interesting things going on in that vow of, of Manjushri. So the first thing of interest is this comparison to life in the Buddha land of Amitabha. 
So you may have heard of the Buddha Amitabha. So Amitabha or Amitabha, and depending on where the emphasis lies, that name has a slightly different meaning, but that Buddha Amitabha is a well-known Buddha. Not, of course, as well known as Shakyamuni, not as well known as our historical Buddha, but Amitabha is probably like the second most popular kind of Buddha. Amitabha is from kalpas and kalpas and kalpas and kalpas ago. Amitabha was a bodhisattva who made vows, made a series of vows, and fulfilled all those vows and now has a Buddha land in the Western direction. And so it's interesting that the Sufism and Islam has come up a lot or come up tonight because in a particular tradition of Amitabha worship, if you were really devoted to Amitabha Buddha, you would actually face the direction of Amitabha Buddha's pure land is not unlike facing Mecca, but this is facing Amitabha Buddha's pure land. And of course, doing prayers and making offerings, either of incense or flowers or just thoughts. But that's kind of a part of this, or, or the way this pure land Buddhism functions in reality, like in the world, where people have images of like an Amitabha Buddha face west, chant the name Amitabha. And they do that. And they are encouraged to do that. Because the idea is, is that Amitabha or Amitabha, one of the vows, one of the, I think they, that, that Bodhisattva made 48 vows. One of those vows was that in the future, if someone just said the name Amitabha Buddha out loud, they would get reborn upon dying. They would be reborn in the Western paradise, in the Western pure land of that Buddha, where they eat Dharma joy. <laughs> they are satisfied by just delighting in Dharma knowledge. So what I find interesting about this um, kind of from somebody who studies a lot of sutras, who teaches a lot of sutras, it's very interesting that this sutra like acknowledges this Amitabha tradition, but then goes a step further. And what that kind of indicates, and there's a lot of, there's a few other things that indicate this, by the way, they actually kind of point to the fact that there was this very early form of Buddhism that was totally monastic, out in the woods, celibate and meditating. Then there was a kind of um, a pure land Buddhism of Amitabha, which by the way, images of this Buddha Amitabha are some of the oldest that we know of. So we know the Amitabha or the cult of Amitabha Buddha is very old. And it would seem that this sutra is acknowledging the fact that there's an established tradition of going to Amitabha's pure land and eating Dharma joy for food. So when Manjushri says, in my Buddha land, it's not going to be like that. Because in my Buddha land, as soon as bodhisattvas just think of it, they're going to have food. But in my Buddha land, no bodhisattva is going to even think of eating it first without offering it to others first. And that is a, is a uh, um, that's part of that maha karunya, that great out turning, outward turning of the heart that I was talking about. It's embodied in that idea that Manjushri has this dream or this vision that all the bodhisattvas in that pure land will be those kinds of bodhisattvas. Now, I, I'll, I'll read the other ones, but there's also, 
yeah, let me, I'll read the other ones. Well, either way, it, it comes up in the other two. I want to point out that at the very end of this, so, so after having this thought that I, I won't dare eat of this food until I've offered it to everybody, just by having that thought, the Bodhisattva miraculously develops instantly the five supernatural powers, which that's pretty cool, right? And then using the supernatural powers, goes to all the Buddha lands throughout the 10 directions, making offerings to all the Buddhas, making offerings to all the sentient beings, making offerings to all the hungry ghosts. And then it says, um, and then the Bodhisattva, after having satisfied everyone's hunger, then explains the Dharma to them to free them from the thirst of desire. And then, in a single thought moment, returns to their original location. So you can, you can read that a number of different ways, of course. You could read it quite literally in that sense, that in Manjushri's future Buddha land, it's going to be like that. But there's this other interesting thing for me, the way that I read that. It has to do with that very last line. And in a single thought moment, they'll be right back where they were. The way that I read that is that it, it only takes a second to wish everybody well. <laughs> How hard is that? Why would that, like, it only takes a second. And for me, that points to like this it's it's such a huge difference the difference of doing a spiritual practice or any kind of cultivation that's where you're only kind of really interested in your own you know your own improvement in that way versus this actual outturning of the of the heart that i'm talking about the point is is that it only takes a second it, it it's really about doing it in that sense. So again, I think you can read that this vow a few different ways, but I like the just the inclusion of that line that and all of that will only take a second is literally what it says. It only take a kashana, a thought moment. All right. Everybody good with that first vow? Excellent. Furthermore, world honored one, I also have this vow that all the bodhisattvas in my Buddha land, upon initially being born, will obtain at will in their hands whatever kinds of precious clothing that they need, clean and fit for a shramana, for, for a monk or a nun. Then they will have this thought. I shall not use these clothes myself until I have offered them to all the Buddhas of the Ten Directions. Then, in a single thought moment, they will go to offer those precious clothings to immeasurable numbers of Buddhas throughout the Ten Directions. And having offered this precious clothing to all the Buddhas, they will return to their original location and then use the clothing themselves. So very important part at the end there, <laughs> it's, we're, not, we're not going hungry, we're not going naked, but the idea is that if, if somebody gave you some nice clothing or whatever it is, just a nice thought of inclusion for all sentient beings, that's one way to read this in that sense. All right, let's do one more, the third one. Because again, they're all kind of part of the same idea. Furthermore, world honored one. I also have this vow 
that all the bodhisattvas in my Buddha land will offer whatever wealth, treasures, or necessities of life that they have to all the Buddhas of the Ten Directions and their followers before they make use of it themselves. Also, my Buddha land will be free of the eight adversities, the unwholesome dharmas, wrongdoing and all uh, transgression, all pain, annoyances, and unhappiness. Okay, so those three go together, food, clothing, and the necessities of life. They talk about wealth and treasures. Sorry about that. They talk about wealth and treasures, but it's the idea is whatever else you would need to survive besides food and clothing. You see that the formula is the same, that before making use of them, they're being offered to basically what's called the immeasurable Buddhas of the 10 directions. By the way, there's also a beautiful way to understand that. Again, in, this is interpretive, but it's also a pretty well understood aspect of the bodhisattva path that, how could I put this? Well, it's about, it's a certain way of seeing. And I've mentioned this a lot in other Dharma talks, so you can go back, but it has to do with what is called um, Buddha nature. And it's this Mahayana idea about how all sentient beings, and actually in some traditions, actually all phenomena, but definitely all sentient beings, it's the idea that all beings have what's called Buddha nature. And that's usually interpreted as this like potential to become awakened. I don't actually teach it that way. I don't think it's quite about Buddha nature is not about potential. It's about actuality. <laughs> um, the actual state of Buddhahood of all sentient beings. And it's the deluded mind that thinks it's just some dude or just some person in that sense. So the, bo the bodhisattva that kind of sees all sentient beings as Buddhas, basically, those can be understood as the immeasurable Buddhas of the 10 directions. So it's a, it's a kind of a classic way to interpret that idea that it's not that I'm necessarily offering my food and clothing and necessities of life to just like Amitabha and just this Buddha and that Buddha. It's again, offering it to all sentient beings in that way. Um, the last part of, uh, yeah. Well, actually let me pause. Any questions, comments, answers, ideas about the three vows? Buddha lands, Bodhisattva path stuff, any, anything that's come up tonight? Okay. Um, let's, uh, yeah, actually, because I wanted to do a little bit more to set us up for next week. So that concludes those three vows. Um, which brings us up, that's uh, the eighth vow of Manjushri. Then our lion courage bodhisattva, our ever curious young bodhisattva, addresses the Buddha again and asks, world honored one, what will the name of Manjushri's Buddha land be? So this is yet another aspect of the Bodhisattva path, which is, of course, once you generate and develop your purified Buddha land, it has a name. So in, for our Buddha, and I actually, I did a whole talk on this too one night, long time ago, but 
in our um, kind of, or in the Buddha, Siddhartha, when Siddhartha becomes Shakyamuni, the Buddha Shakyamuni, his Buddha land, that Buddha land is called Saha, a word that means endurance. And it's an interesting aspect of Mahayana Buddhism where they start to refer to Shakyamuni Buddha's pure land, Saha. And that's where all of a sudden it's like we're living kind of in Shakyamuni Buddha's pure land in that way. It starts to get a little trippy. But the idea is, is that in the same way that Shakyamuni Buddha's pure land has its special name, Amitabha Buddha's pure land is called Sukhavati Vyuha. Well, the bodhisattvas want to know, what's Manjushri's pure land going to be called? The Buddha said, the name of that Buddha land will be the accumulation of purity and the fulfillment according to vows. Lion Courage asked, world honored one, in what direction will that Buddha land be located? And of course, all these Buddha lands are in a specific direction. The Buddha replied, in the southern direction. And this Saha world will be contained within it. Okay, so that's where we're going to stop tonight. I, I will talk a little bit about that ending there because that's a little wild. <laughs> um, so the accumulate this name. Um, accumulation of purity and the fulfillment according to vows, that kind of lines up with this sutra. Like this sutra has been about accumulating purity and fulfilling vows in that way. So there's kind of an overlap in terms of the name of the Buddha land. So just kind of let that, that's the name of the Buddha land. Manjushri is always associated with the southern direction, by the way. Um, this happens within the world of Buddhism that, like I've mentioned, the different Buddhas are in different um, directions. Different bodhisattvas are in different directions. There's a, there's a lot I could say just about the directionality thing of all of this, too. Um, the one thing that I will remind everybody Part of this um, pure land business. So a big part of the pure land business, again, I've talked about this in more detail in other nights, but it has a lot to do with, well, this sort of, I never really know how to put this. It's always such an interesting kind of complicated idea. I always introduce it talking about the idea of what would be called objective reality versus subjective experience. And in Dharma Talks Past, I've talked about the, the metaphysical and philosophical problems of presuming an objective world. I've talked about this idea that we, it's the idea that we have, I have it, you probably have it. And it's the idea that me and you and all of us, that we're all in the same world, but just looking at that same world differently. You know, one objective world a bunch of different kind of views of that one objective world. But like I just said, there's a lot of metaphysical and philosophical problems with presuming this objective world. The main problem with, with that presumption is how to ever access 
that one objective world? What would that even mean to access that one objective world? Wouldn't that just be my subjective experience of that? Quite a conundrum. Philosophically and metaphysically speaking, you can, you can go off and try to uh, prove the objective world. You can go fight, try to find the objective world. Yeah, good luck. In the world of Buddhism, all forms of Buddhism, they have basically removed that idea of the one objective world. And it is just an immeasurable number of intersubjective experiences. And by intersubjective, what I mean is, is that I say a bunch of stuff that I think means things to me. <laughs> And then you hear that, however you hear that, I don't know how you would hear that. You process it and then say a bunch of stuff back that I process and hear. And so even though I never have access to how you understood it and you never have access to how I understood it, there's this intersubjective experience via language that we are having. So within that, worldview of no objective reality, but an infinite number of subjective experiences. What that means is, is that North and South are not the North Pole and the South Pole. North and South are not places on the earth. North and South extend out from your existential subjective experience. It's why the Buddhist or the Mahayana are always talking about the 10 directions, including the zenith and the nadir. It's space extending out from your subjective experience. And when you, when you kind of get into that idea, and you, for one reason or another, either logically or through direct insight, if you abandon that idea of an objective reality and you are sitting squarely at the center of 10 directions, that's called your Buddha land, your subjective world. <laughs> and the idea now is, is that you begin purifying your Buddha land in that sense. So now North and South, they take on a whole new meaning when there's no objective world in that sense. So that, that's sort of, actually that's a whole other, aside there, a uh, deeper one about the subjective world. But what I was getting to was this curious line at the end where the Buddha says, oh yeah, and by the way, the Saha world will be inside of Manjushri's pure land. But that lines up with Manjushri's original vow. Let's see here. His, one of his original vows was that I vow to make Buddha worlds equal in number to the grains of sand of the Ganges River, all into a single Buddha land, adorned with immeasurable, wondrous intermingled jewels. So it was always part of Manjushri's plan to make this one kind of big, uh, big Buddha land in that way. And so it shouldn't be a surprise that this Saha world is inside that world. And of course, we could, we could go even crazier with this since like all of this tonight is taking place in, in some realm and maybe that's called Manjushri's Pure Land. So, <laughs> all right, everybody, that's gonna be it for me unless there's any questions, comments, answers or ideas or realizations.
All right, everybody. Are, are you going to talk about the Saha world next week or was that it? I already, I did a whole night on the Saha world. You did? I must I, have been gone then. I don't remember. It was the sixth class of this series. I have a, I have okay. a list of all of them. Yeah. Okay, good. I'll, uh, I'll go to YouTube and check it out. Yeah, because the Saha world came up much earlier in the sutra. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Um, Thank hey, you. So, uh, oh, I think there's a question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, I kind of want to go back and watch some of the other classes. And, uh, how do I do that? <laughs> Where oh. are they? Where are they more? <laughs> we have a, we have a YouTube channel. So okay. if, um, and I'm gonna put I'm gonna put a link um, in the chat okay. for our YouTube channel. So I'll put that in there right now. So awesome. all of this, all of Michael's um, uh, classes are are there. Um, Thanks, in addition, Donald. oh sure, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. 